Welcome to Speckopod, the only podcast focusing on breaking free in the AC industry by bringing bold and amazing guests to share their stories with us, discuss your achievements and the challenges that you face in the AC industry. Ingrid, thank you so much for joining me today. And it's quite uh, a special day today because we're recording this in Paris, so not too far from your office. Exactly. And also you recently celebrated six years yes. at yes, RPW, right? How about we start with, I prepared some icebreakers for you, as you know, and we can start with these to kind of uh, set the tone before we dive into the, the topics, right? So it's midnight, your phone is ringing, it's the office. What's the most likely reason they are calling you? <laughs> I think it will be the apocalypse into <laughs> one project, something like that, like the a platform doesn't working so there is no access at all for to the to the models and they need to send this presentation in this night i know that with the it uh, people we have like a lot of backups mm -hmm. so i'm not sure this kind of situations could happen but if there is like a succession of issues this will be the reason why they will call me and you have to be passionate and patient of course and yeah. <laughs> show up <laughs> and uh, the last one to celebrate us recording in paris What's the best thing about Paris, in your opinion? Huh. I would say two things. First, the fact that it's a city that's evolving a lot and very quickly. So when you think you know like a neighbor that you're going like often, as I was when I was younger, I know that those places change very easily. So even if you think to know a place and you come back there like three months after or, or a year, you will see something completely different about the things you've seen before. And the second one, it would be culture things you can find because it's very easy to see some very nice exhibitions, some nice uh, theater plays, um, movies also. So there is a lot of different atmosphere of culture, of architect artistic uh, yep. design also. So If I like, because I like to, to not only to working on the beam, of course, but I like to working into different tools. Really? Why? <laughs> to see different things. Okay. So I know in Paris, it's very easy to find some new culture places, to meet some new people to win on this kind of, um, this kind of events. So I would say those two things. It's a city that changed a lot and it's a city with a lot of different artistic news. Uh, I like that. I'm also really surprised that you didn't say architecture <laughs> for the sake of this yeah. podcast. Podcast, you know, <laughs> but I love it. I love your answer. And so now let's, you know, jump right into it. Um, I'll give a very short intro, but you, you're free to build up on this, obviously. Um, so Ingrid Soulange, BIM manager at Renzo Piano Building Workshop, or RPBW, which is an international architectural practice based in Paris. And one of the first questions I have for you, Ingrid, is working at a studio like RPBW must be a dream to any architectural student, right? And I'd love to know from you, how did this happen? Like, how did you get into working at the studio? And, you know, it's been six years, so I'm sure you have a, a lot to share there. I came here by two ways. Six years ago, I was quitting my previous job as an architect, but I was looking forward to working into this beam because I was I liked to working on Revit at the time and I wanted to, to working less into projects as an architect, but mostly into some coordinations, beam stuff. Mm -hmm. I never worked as a beam coordinator or as a beam assistant or as a beam manager uh, before, so I apply uh, to this job. I didn't know it was at the beginning from RPBW, uh, but I sent my, my portfolio to working as a BIM assistant. And then a couple months, a couple weeks before, uh, I was in um, in Lyon, in the south of France. And I was uh, I was at a lunchtime with a friend of mine. He was a BIM manager into another office and he knew that I was looking for a job. So he was a friend of the previous BIM manager at the office. So he sent to, to this person my portfolio. And, you know, I, I keep saying you've been there six years. I didn't say congratulations. Congratulations, I'm going to say it again, but um, I think you clearly proved that you were able to, to be successful in your role and to grow in the role as well. And actually, I wanted to ask you another question. And this, before asking it, I'm going to share some stats with you. So women represent 10.9% of the construction industry workforce and only 1.25% of women are on job sites. So this is coming from a US report in 2020. So I'm sure these stats changed since then. Mm -hmm. But still, I would like to know your view on, you know, this is a fact, women are vastly underrepresented in AEC. How do you feel about the stats that I shared with you and the steps that should be taken to potentially reach gender equality one day in this industry? 
I was speaking of that with a, a friend of mine like a couple couple of days ago, and she was saying that to me because I and I think I never working as a into a construction site before. Right. So she told me that, for example, shoes or uniforms into construction sites they never fit women's bodies. It's only for for male, for example, for the size of shoes, there is only some male size, so it's very difficult to find something easy oh, wow, to okay. to to wear for them. And also for if there is some pregnant woman, there is no uniform outfit. So I think it's not only a point of view of if women can do that or not, they can obviously, but there is no little details that can help to helping them to feel comfortable. If if we don't try it, we will never see a positive answer. Every woman I've spoken with and they have like working into a construction site, everything's went well. So in my point of view, we just need to, to go for it, to go to a construction site or at least to have the possibility to propose to go. It's almost like what you're saying is um, making the environment more inclusive and exactly. welcoming to women. Exactly. Um, and I'm glad you shared, you know, something that came up during a conversation you had your, with, with your friend. It just adds up to the stats I shared in the beginning. And I also remember we had this conversation uh, at Built Riga, oui. right? Oui. Where we're a group of women in a corner <laughs> and during that event. And my follow-up question to you, Ingrid, is your perspective on this industry is obviously very particular and valuable. You're open to share also your views, not only as women in AEC, but a woman of color in AEC. And I'd like to ask you how that shaped uh, your professional experiences so far. That's that's a very, at least in France, I don't know how it is in uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. In France, it's a, it's a very taboo subject that it's... It's not something that I should speak of. Not because it's a, it's a bad thing, but mostly because it's a big taboo to speak about. And also because I want to feel that I belong to the position I have. Not because of my skin, not because of my gender, but just because I'm... I'm working, but this is this is uh, very very tricky because it's it's my point of view because I want to be like transparent as I've, to be equal as everyone. Mm -hmm. But in my entire life, I always had some sentence, very strange, some uh, gestures, some things that put me into a position that I'm not feel comfortable to be back to be a black woman into this industry. It's, uh, it's, I'm not sure we will have the time during this podcast to speak about how is it Everything. to be a black female into, it, into that, but I, I just put my boundaries okay. because I just put my, my focus because I can't fight everything. I can't teach everyone what is to be me there. So I just say, okay, this is not my choice. If someone wants to come to me, asking to me some questions and make the things more open and more comfortable, not for me, but for everyone. I will be glad to give my point of view. But if no one asks, I will never go in to try and to change them because it's not my place, I think, because it's too much. Because also in, in life, as I said, when since I am a child, it's a very, it's something to, you, you know, quite quickly when you are young that it's an issue for people, mostly in France. Again, I don't know how is it in, uh, in the UK. So since I am very, very young, I always trying to put my, my focus, my fight where, where I want to put my energy on. So when I am into some tricky situations where people can tell me something very strange, um, I just say to myself, Ingrid, you don't have the time to deal with that. This is not my problem. But into my daily work, it's at the office, at least at, uh, at uh, RPBW, it's never has been a subject and... My experience, it's great. Otherwise, I will never stay there for six years. So my goal is just to make my work first, to make things more easy for the team and for their project. And that's it. Yeah. Because this is the only things people are asking to me to do. And I'm trying to do my best to just think to that goal. That's it. It's very uh, impressive and also, I think, important what you said about picking your battles and knowing when to with energy in, in the right things or not, but it, you know, it must also be hard for you to keep some things in. One thing that really impressed me when you uh, shared, I mean, we, we exchanged some thoughts before this recording, was your work ethic. And you said something about you work three times more than others <laughs> and you're very, you know, disciplined um, and a hard worker. So how do you fight burnout? I mean, there must have been a, a time when you felt like you were overwhelmed. 
Um, and I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. I hope I have a work ethic. I hope so. And I, uh, yes, I really hope because of the West, I just need to, to rethink myself more. And I hope I am good at what I'm doing. There is a lot of things I'm not doing well, really. I'm just trying to do my best to keep things not cracking at the office. Uh, but I, I was saying that to you for working more because, as I said, it was my first job as a BIM manager, as a BIM world It was really my first time at that. So there is a lot of things I need to learn quickly. And there is like 10 different projects at this moment and like 1,000 people with questions. And I need to work more for being able to answer to their questions. To answer your questions about how to fight burnout. First, I am glad to not have one. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> I would say three things maybe. The first things could be my family first, because otherwise I'm speaking when I was like six years before. Right. Okay? But when I came uh, without my family, without my sister, it will be like impossible for me to stay on track and to continue and to stay happy and to smile. <laughs> so my family was a very, very strong thing to me. It still, it still is. And the team, the architect with who I'm working with, Since I was there, I was always trying to be nice to them, to be polite, to be there when they ask very, very quick questions or, or very difficult questions to answer. And even if also there, there was into a very tricky situations because they were, they need to, to deliver very fast models. Mm -hmm. And we, I think since the beginning, we always find the right balance between us. They always give to me enough space and enough time for learning the things that I need to give to them answers. And also, they were never put me into very complex situations. They're always trying to understand me. And I'm always trying to be as transparent as I can be to them when I don't know something and when I know. So it, I worked, but they were very understandable with my situation. So I was really, very grateful for that. And the last one is the administration of the office because the, the partners, Antoine, Joost or Philippe, they were very supportive to me since the beginning and they always give to me my chance to, to try something. And still today, huh, we, we are trying to work in together and they always trying to give my place to speak. And when there is something wrong, They, they listened to me. The work is something because the work could be very hard, but when you have the support, from different people okay. it's very helpful for not having like a burnout stuff and without that I will not be able to stay like six years there I'm happy to hear you you found the right uh, not only work environment but also supportive team it's very important especially as you're a big manager new to the role over the years you've seen that support And so I'd love to ask you, what's um, a project or an idea that you're particularly proud of today? Looking back, you know, six years, I'm sure there must have been things you worked on that you're very happy about. Are you alive? <laughs> <laughs> There's one project. I'm dead. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just kidding. No, the, the, I think now the project into um, quite proud of, it was the coordination of the Tokyo's project. Uh, it's a project, I think we started that like four years ago. It's a Japanese uh, headquarter in Tokyo. Okay. I think it was one of the first, the first main beam projects in Japan at that time. It was in 2020. The local architect, the engineers didn't speak English. They never worked on Revit. So it, at the beginning, it was super challenging because the office is very, they have some very specific targets. They have like, a, they want to do something very, very uh, well designed from the beginning. So the need to have like engineers and to have local architects very on board very quickly. So the beginning was super tricky because I needed to speak to, to them and to learn to them and to working on Revit and how to working on the collaborative platform and so on. And now I'm super happy to see how far this project is going, how smooth the things were. It was some very hard moments sometimes because sometimes things not working, but It's a very un wonderful environment we have done on Revit. We have like a very, uh, I think we, it's a project where we have a lot of, I think it's one of the most easiest projects that we have. We have like everything detailed. They really want to, to find the perfect design. So they're trying everything into this model. They always listen to me. When I'm trying to propose something, the team will say, okay, Revit, we can follow what you proposed. And it was a very uh, straightforward process. And I'm very glad about how things are now 
So um, I, I may say that. And that another one could be I'm working with the office in Geneva with uh, Giuseppe Samprini, the B manager of this office. Uh, I think he's there for like 10 years or maybe more. And since my previous responsible left, we're working as a team mm -hmm. with Giuseppe and now with uh, Irene and uh, Anna. So we we have found a way to create like a beam team between us, not only from Paris and another one in Geneva, but we're trying to very communicate like the most often as possible. And I'm quite happy to see how far we, we went since now, how well we are between us. I never thought 10 years ago that I will be able to create like this team at this office and how to see things went well. So I'm, I'm quite happy for that. And I've met a lot of different people since the, 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 all the years. So I would say those two things. I think the, the last point you made also reminded me of what you said in the beginning about being a collective group or collaborating together. So it sounds like you guys really found a, a supportive group and it impacts in a very positive way your work and your, your projects in general. Um, which leads me to my next question, more focused on RPBW as a company and the fact that, you know, it's it's a um, very well-known firm and you guys have clearly set some uh, some tone in the AC industry. What do you think keeps you at the top uh, in terms of workflows, also mindset, or is there any strategic um, approach that you think differentiates you from the other firms in the AC industry? I don't know how really specifically how the other firms work, but the things I can say, it's I'm quite impressed about how partners, the teams, the associates, everyone tries to put their energy into how to make the perfect design. Mm -hmm. So they're trying everything. I can, I can tell you they're trying everything they can or find the perfect design the perfect corner, the perfect facade. They try and like they, they do like thousand different tests or make sure they find the perfect result. So I may say that because and in the office I went before, it was not like this. This one is very specific to see how beautiful the documents are, how very collective mind they're trying to find a solution on the on the design. They're always trying to nourish their their mind as architects. And they always trying to test something. They, I never saw as many design options at this office. I never saw how dedicated they can be for finding the, the perfect details. If you go, for example, uh, into the Tokyo's project, they, they trying everything for uh, make sure that it will be perfect for the for the project. Detail oriented, also. It sounds like a bunch yes. of perfectionists. I must. Yeah. Say. yeah. <laughs> um, right. But you must be, feel proud working, you know, I mentioned your work ethic, but you working with people like that means that you're probably very similar uh, in terms of detail-oriented and perfectionist. <laughs> Ingrid, I have a question for you, which is more around the architecture, engineering, construction, so AEC industry. And the question is, what do you think is the elephant in the AEC room? I think it's AI. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people will say that after. But Let's, we will see. We're going to ask this question to all the other guests. <laughs> Because it's something that we can't avoid and we maybe don't want to avoid. Mm -hmm. We need to listen to it, to test it, to, to, to try where we want to go. It's something that completely changed the way of, of work. It's not only into the BIM site. It's for everyone at the office. So everyone has a point of view. Everyone wants to nourish the philosophy of the office by that or with that. So it's it's something that we we speak a lot at the office. Can you give us an example of how it was or how it's being adopted uh, at the office? I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> it's not. No, no, no. You're not allowed. Okay. No, I'm not. I, NDA sign. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's okay. I'll move on to the next question. Okay, it's okay. No so um, the next question is more around Again, work ethic and inspiring the, the future generations of BIM managers. So a quote from Warren Buffett, uh, he said, it's good to learn from your mistakes. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us your mistakes to, <laughs> you know, inspire um, young BIM or future BIM managers? And most, most importantly, what are the lessons you would want them to take away? Hmm. First, first one, the, the main mistake I've made, I think it's working too much. I worked too much in my point of view and I didn't find the right balance between my 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 life and my job. 
And I, I would say that maybe trying to find the right balance between the work you need to do if you don't want to do like to, to working too much, to thinking too much of the project, of project. Also for women, I would say it's trying to, to trust the, I will say not everyone, but tries to try first to trust themselves, to try to do it because if I never had the chance to, to give my applications, I will never be able to do what I'm doing now. So I would say that try, but it's... Um, as someone's tell me like a couple, a couple months ago, we just take a break, just it's fine to, to make mistakes. And mostly it's like this that we learn. So I would say it's okay to be, to be not perfect for everyone every time uh, and really enjoying life because it's a very complex, complicated work. Um, you need to keep in mind that people come to you only when they have problems, when they have issues or questions. So it could be sometimes very, Alone, a loneliness work because even if you're working with teams, sometimes you you're just thinking too too much, and sometimes it's very blowing your mind. So this is sometimes happens to me. But when you have questions, when you have thoughts, or you have doubts, always trying to find someone or to speak to someone just for just for having like a better overview of things. And again, enjoying life. <laughs> <laughs> you said that really? twice. So that, that's oui. very important. Oui. Oui, oui, oui. But it's it's important, I think, what you mentioned about work-life balance. We don't really realize how that can go away really, really quickly. And it sounds like you lived it. So going out of the office sometimes, going out of the computer, it's something very valuable that I can... This is an advice I would like to give to young people. Just Go to conference, to meetings, to to podcast. <laughs> I hope you don't regret leaving the stressful work to come here today because no, I no, know you're very busy. Uh, no, no. I, to be honest, I have a, I have accept to do this podcast because I when when we went to the build, mm -hmm. there was not a lot of young people. And when I was when I, I see you now, you told me that you saw my presentation at the Pecha Kucha. Yes. Yeah. A couple of years, I think it was a year ago. Something. Yes. And during this event, at the end, I've, I've spoken with different young students. They didn't know how to start to working into this world. So they're asking to me advice. And it was the first time of my life someone asking to me my advice of that, because I never thought it would be something to say could be valuable to someone. And if I can help young people, uh, and if this podcast could be a good help for them, I will be super glad to continue to speak to them. If someone wants to reach me out, it will be with pleasure to answer to their questions if they have some. Well, now you're making me regret not wanting wanting to become a BIM expert. <laughs> but I think that's, oh, it, it's it's a great thing that you're offering. You know, people are always valuing from speaking to those yeah. already in the field. So I want to thank you on behalf of the future people that will reach out to you. <laughs> and Ingrid, we're reaching actually the end of the recording. So the last question I have for you in the spirit of the podcast, which as I already shared with you, the aim is to uh, advocate for people breaking free uh, in AEC. And so my question to you is, what does breaking free in AEC mean for you? Because it can be, you know, interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. And how should we achieve it together in AEC? I don't know if I can change something, but I think <laughs> I would think it's Maybe open the dialogue, the communication. I was I'm, I'm thinking about the subject we were speaking earlier about black woman being a woman. If we can open the discussion with people, if the people above, the responsible of right. this the management, wants, voilà, thank you, the management wants to open the dialogue and propose to people to to change something. I think this will be super valuable and they will break something that everyone doesn't think because when I've spoken with guys in general uh, during these BIM events and I see there is not a lot of women and I ask to them what do they think of that? Not only to women and also to them. They're super sad to not see like an equality. So it's not only from women to think that the, the change could be come from them mm -hmm. but also from men but also from the management. So if the management say okay I saw that into my company there is like two guys going to this event maybe I want to propose like a 50-50 what, what do they think what could be changed into the schedule for make things more flexible for a woman because sometimes they could be like young mother it would be different difficult for them to go to events or to go to sites so maybe if they want to change it the management has to take the, the, the responsibility to, to change in my point of view it's a very positive way to start something by the management 
around. I think that's a fair point, right? Any big change happening in an organization needs to start from exactly. the, the top, right? But yeah, Ingrid, thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing uh, thoughts, ideas, but also perspectives on AC. And I'm really happy you were the first guest for this podcast. Mm-hmm.